Well, good morning, West Portal. If you've been tracking with us this fall, you know we've been walking through the New Testament letter of Ephesians, exploring both the wonder and the walk of what it means to be alive in Christ. Last Sunday, we came to Ephesians chapter 4 uh, of a six-chapter book. It is the turning point in that letter where we are invited to walk worthy. That because of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, things have changed. And we find ourselves, as James was mentioning, in a new reality and a part of a new humanity. And it's an invitation to start to live in sync, to get with the program of what Jesus is on about in the world. Last Sunday, uh, to walk worthy, at least in part, means to walk in community with other followers of Jesus. And there's good news aspects to this. We're better together. God has gifted his church uh, with a wonderful uh, complementary um, diversity in the people gifts that he has given us. Uh, we grow, we mature as we get to do life together. This is the good news. The downside, of course, is it's precisely in these di differences that can be complementary that we often experience disagreement and misunderstanding and sometimes friction. And so it comes as no surprise that right at the outset, Paul says, oh yes, and this will take your very best efforts to maintain this togetherness. Uh, we're going to build on that today a little bit, and I wanted to, just as a way of table setting, because we come to the, the last half of chapter 4. By the way, if you have your Bibles, you can already turn there if you want. I was going to ask, how many of you have ever had the opportunity to be a part of a culture that's very different from Canada? Show of hands. I, I won't ask you for specifics. So it's quite a few of you. If you've ever been a part of a different culture, what you learn very quickly is that you need new customs, new behaviors, and, and even new ways of seeing the world around you in order to know how to function well in it. Uh, as part of my senior year at Bethany College, our senior class spent three weeks on a missions trip in India. India is a very different culture from Canada, and I feel like I could tell half a dozen different stories. I'll, I'll try to limit myself to two this morning that stand out. So we were in Hyderabad, and Close to where we, were, where we were staying was a marketplace, and in the evenings, one of the things that we often wanted to do as a team was to go do a little bit of shopping, pick up some souvenirs, get a bit of a taste of the culture, etc. The problem was that to get to this marketplace, you had to cross a multi-lane road, like three lanes in each direction. Now, in Canada, we frown on jaywalking. Right? And if you want to cross a road, you look for the nearest set of lights and or pedestrian crosswalk and you press a button and you wait for your turn and it tells vehicles to stop and you can move across the road in relative ease and safety. Uh, this may be true in other parts of India, but it was not here. Uh, in India, if you want to cross a road, multi-lane or otherwise, this will date me, but how many of you remember that original two-dimensional arcade game called Frogger? That's how you cross the road, and some of you have to Google that later. It's okay. But in India, when you want to cross a multi-lane road, you just go, oh, is anybody coming in the first lane? And if the answer is no, you walk across that lane, and then you stop. And you go, is anybody coming in the next lane? And you wait for a vehicle to go by, and you go, oh, no. Oh, and then you walk by that. And then a bus will go by on both sides of you within, like, three feet. And you go... Is there anybody? And that's how you cross a road. And what I want to say is we went out to the marketplace really seldom because it was so traumatic. Like you had to psych yourself up not just to get there, but to get back. And I'd be in the middle of the road watching a mom with her baby. Ha ah, dee da dee da bus goes by. And it, different culture, different way of doing things. Uh, the other one that comes to mind is um, Indian culture, uh, hospitality is a deep-seated value in their culture. They may not have much, but out of what they have, they love to be generous, uh, especially to guests and especially to international guests. And one of the ways that they loved to bless and be generous to us as a team was they loved to put bottles of their local pop, thumbs up, that's actually what it's called, uh, in your hand. Now, there are many people that love thumbs up. Great. Most of us, this was not a great experience. Pick between Pepsi and Coke, most of you have a preference. Pick whichever one you like least and pretend that you also now need to add about three tablespoons of molasses to it. And I feel like you have a rough approximation of thumbs up. 
Now, we're polite in Canadian culture, and so we did what any polite Canadian would do when you're handed something that you're not super fond of, but you know it's something that they're being very generous with. You tough it out and you glug it back. The quicker I can drink this, the happier I'll be, and I'll politely decline any future offer. No, I'm thank I thank you. I've, I've had enough. This is how we would do it in our culture. What we hadn't counted on is you can't say no to Indian hospitality. There's no such thing. Your polite decline will be overwhelmed by insistent generosity, and empty hands are an opportunity to be further generous. And so the quicker you drank thumbs up, the quicker you had another one in your hand. And there was members of our team who were on their third and their fourth, much to their chagrin, uh, before they finally learned that if you didn't want to keep having this hospitality be graciously given to you, you do not finish it. Just nurse it. And you just kind of sip it occasionally and make sure it stays half full. And this is actually, anyway, to function in a different culture, this is a chance to share some stories. But the point is, in a different culture, you need to learn completely new ways of thinking and perceiving reality in order to learn how to function and operate in it. And this, in part, is what Paul is getting at here as we come to kind of this aspect of the book of Ephesians, that because of Jesus Christ, things have changed. Uh, we're going to come to a set of, it's going to feel like today we're reading rules and regulations, like, oh goodness, we have to live up to all of these things. Don't think about them in terms of rules and regulations. He's trying to paint a picture of the new culture that we find ourselves in and the new practices, the new behaviors, the new way of operating in this culture that makes sense in it. And so that's kind of a framework you can keep in mind. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going, and maybe it'll be best if we just jump into our passage and I'll find some talking points along the way. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Oh, I'm adding how I've memorized this. And they are full of greed. <laughs> that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So this is the second therefore uh, that we come to in chapter 4. So chapter 4 began with this kind of hinge point, therefore walk worthy. Get in sync with the way of Jesus. And, and today our passage opens with the second therefore, don't walk like a Gentile. Which, by the way, is a really odd expression. I don't know if you remember this, but this is a letter written to a church of Gentile converts. So it'd be like Paul writing to us here at West Portal saying, don't walk like a Canadian. To which you and I would say, how, like, like a Jamaican? How, how should I walk? I don't know. I can't swing my hips like that. I'm a Mennonite. Um, I just, it's actually not hard to wrap your head around. Paul's just not using the word in an ethnic sense. Don't walk like a Canadian would be a common way of saying something like, walk differently than the non-Jesus following culture that you're immersed in and that you've taken your cues from, Right? You and I need a new way of seeing reality and a new invitation in how to live and be shaped. And so there's essentially two schools of thought here. One, Paul says, you can take your cues from the culture around you. He uses the word Gentile, but I'll use Canadian because it's not radically different. When you look around, we're immersed uh, in our culture. In our, in, you could talk about governments and policies and neighborhoods and attitudes and values and all of these things, but that's largely non-Jesus following. And he has this spiral in the way that he talks about it. It's actually a really kind of a dark picture that he paints, and there's a handful of things maybe I'll just draw attention to. But he says at, at the outset that it begins with an inability to see life Clearly, uh, he uses words like futility of thinking, darkened in their understanding, ignorance that is in them. Uh, friends, it's not that our Canadian culture is dumb. That's not the point. But when you take Jesus out of the equation, you're processing life 
with less than a full perspective or definition of reality. One of the things I think I've said before is when you and I can't see clearly, now whether that's without your glasses or whether it's because you still have ice on the part of the windshield of your vehicle to use kind of a, a contemporary analogy here, you and I know that we're not making the best decisions that we could make. If there's ice on two-thirds of the windshield of your car, you can make the best decisions possible, but you don't have all the information. You need to make good decisions. And when we process life decisions without a full and a complete picture, we're going to be prone to make poor decisions that are going to hurt us and often hurt those around us. You're going to separate yourself from the creator and the giver of life. You separate yourself from life itself. There's a detachment that happens here. He talks about a growing insensitivity as, as you persist in this. No, I don't want to take my cues from this or from anyone. I, I know best how to live. I am whatever you want to kind of use for uh, I'm, I'm the pilot of my life. Um, there's a growing hardness, a growing callousness, an insensitivity that creeps in with this. Uh, the part that actually wasn't in this particular rendition, it's a more modern NIV, but that I grew up with, um, talks about with a continual lust for more. It's an interesting expression. I found myself thinking of, we spent some time in what I want to call the existential Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes last spring. When you and I try to answer questions of life's purpose and life's meaning, what, what does fully human living or life look like? When you take God out of the equation, we're forced to substitute something into that place and everybody has to do it and you can take good things but inevitably we wind up trying to take things that can be received as good gifts from the hand of god but we ask of them to be ultimate in our life and you can take family or you can take a, like a marriage uh, you can take your career you can take accomplishments and you can go i don't know how to say this gently but i mean like good gifts yes you want to ask a spouse to be the, the source of joy, purpose, and meaning in your life? You're asking something nobody can ever live up to. They will let you down. Um, and so we try to fill our life with these different things. You can try to put money away in your bank account. You can try to party on the weekend. Um, sensuality, that which gives you pleasure, right? You can chase sex. You can chase anything you want. At the end of the day, it comes back leaving you a little bit empty. And our natural inclination is, if it felt good in the moment, but after repeatedly doing it, I feel empty, our first answer to ourselves is, maybe I'm just not doing it enough. Maybe if I party more, I'll be happier. And so this is that spiral and that slide that, that you can, and frankly, you can just watch it happen in our culture. I'll be happy when? How much money do you have to have in the bank before you're happy? It can't provide that for you. There's no answer to that. Uh, and you can fill your life with different things. But so there's kind of two schools that you can go to, and Paul is loosely using this analogy. You can take your cues from culture around you, or you can take your cues from Jesus. He actually talks, it has the language of Jesus' school. You learned Christ, you heard Christ, you were taught in Christ in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You and I hear this kind of language and we think classroom. It's our frame of reference. And so we think, I learned about Jesus. I heard of Jesus. In fact, I, my old NIV actually inserts that word. Neither of those are in there uh, in the original. And it's not saying that the concept of that is wrong, but it gives us a sense that what we're learning is primarily intellectual, and it's not Paul's heartbeat. What he wants us to understand is that it's relational, that you and I actually can learn Christ. As weird as that is, right? You're like, well, I can learn a piano. I could learn how to play hockey. I could learn a concept like mathematics. Learning a person is odd, but it's precisely the invitation. Get inside Jesus and learn what makes him tick. Let Jesus get inside you. Let him teach you what makes creation and humanity tick. You heard him. He says it directly. And it's not that his audience heard Jesus in a first-hand way, but I think what Paul is getting at is this. And we don't think about it this way, but I love this, um, the language. Friends, because God has given you and me as believers, his Holy Spirit, right, takes up residence in the hearts and lives uh, of people. Friends, when you and I open our Bibles, we have the opportunity to not just be reading about Jesus, but to hear from him. 
in a relational sense. When we gather, like whether you're listening to a Christian podcast, whether you're here on a Sunday morning, we hear, you, you don't just hear me. You have the opportunity to hear Christ. And you know it because I, and unbeknownst to me, there'll be a part of the morning where you just suddenly feel like God brings a person or a situation or something to mind. He taps on your heart and you're like, how did Andrew know this? I don't. This is the relational nature of hearing and learning Christ. You were taught in him. Uh, Paul makes Jesus, if I can say it this way, the teacher, the teaching, as well as the context for which we understand how to apply the teaching. How will we know? Look at the life of Jesus. I'll make just a comment about you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Truth here means more than just the opposite of false. The word carries the idea of that which is authentic, that which is genuine, that which is what we might call the real deal or the real article. His point is this, Jesus knows what makes creation tick. Jesus knows what makes economies tick. And deep down, friends, he knows how humanity is designed and created to tick. He knows how you and I will live best and live fully, physically, emotionally, relationally, sexually. Jesus understands how we have been created to live. And this is an invitation again. You can choose. Do you want to take your cues on how to live from the world and the culture around you? Or is the new humanity part of a new culture, things have changed because of Jesus, we're invited to start to take our cues from a new place. Uh, and as part of this process, he's going to use the language of taking off and of putting on. And you can just kind of watch for it as we get to some concrete examples. Let's keep the text going here. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So Paul goes on now to give you kind of a picture. Here's some tangible ideas of what the living into this Jesus school looks like. Not this, but this. Take off, lay aside, put on. It's reminiscent. I found myself thinking in a few places this week of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is fond of saying, you have heard it said, not this. And then he goes, but I say to you, here's how you need to think about this. So Paul has five concrete examples, not this, but this. I'll just kind of talk my way through a few of these here. So the first is lay aside falsehood, literally the lie, and learn to speak truth. The, the word for falsehood or lie here is the Greek word pseudo, uh, from where we get that sense of less than authentic, less than genuine, not a knockoff, we might say, if you're buying a product of sorts. Trust and truth are the bedrock of all relationships. And you and I kind of understand this. The more that we find ourselves in places where we have to kind of pose and posture and massage that external veneer of our life and kind of maintain that for what we want others to see, the less genuine we are. It's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle. The, the more you have to massage and posture your appearance, the more you have to do it. The lie gives way to the lie gives way to the lie. Uh, hear me out on this. I just want to say, I, I'm not insisting that everybody needs to know everything about everybody. That would be unhealthy. There are proper places, ways to choose to be authentic and vulnerable. But as part of a community built on the foundation of, on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ himself, uh, and even as we were saying last week in James' reference this morning, that, that's centered on the ability to speak the truth in love. We understand that we are built and created for authentic, vulnerable relationships. This is a, a key component of who we are. Do you have places where you can do that. This is a laying aside of that need to consistently posture and manipulate my image and where I can actually be real with people. 
Not this, but this. One more comment on speaking truth. When you and I hear the invitation to speak the truth in love, our first thought is what we need to say about and to other people. And certainly this is an aspect of it, okay? I get that. What I just want to suggest when it comes to speaking the truth, the hardest place to start, but where it needs to start, is us actually speaking the truth to and about ourselves and between us and God. It is actually easier for me to speak truth about what somebody else needs to hear because they're just dumb than it is to be really honest and say, but I don't have it all together. And these are the places where I know I'm running from God and I'm struggling to pray or I'm struggling with purity or I'm struggling in my marriage or I, like pick, pick and choose whatever you need to substitute in there. But that place where we are actually open and vulnerable with God and with ourselves is often the hardest place to start. And I want to suggest to you actually learning to speak the truth to yourself is a precondition to doing it well in the lives of other people. Not this, but this. The second one is a little bit clunky. I, I think this is the way I would word it. Be angry, don't sin. Not, and some of you are like, wait, what? It, 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 it's odd. I, 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 I'll admit that. A couple of thoughts. Ah, I, anger in itself, I'm not convinced, is sinful. Hear me out on this. Anger is a flare-up emotionally when life in some way, shape, or form doesn't go as we expect or as we had hoped. We're disappointed, we're frustrated, and, and that bubbles up in us. I'm not convinced the emotion itself is sinful. What we do with it is. Uh, and this is where I found myself thinking again of the Sermon on the Mount. I, it, we, Jesus has this really invasive section on purity and sexual purity, such that he says anyone who looks at somebody lustfully has already essentially committed adultery with them in their heart. It's this really kind of heavy passage. When we were walking through that, one of the things we said is Jesus tends to, um, it's subtle, but there's a discrepancy between the glance and the lingering look, where we said the, the appreciative glance, wow, it's a really good looking person. Is, is, is not a sinful moment. It's the lingering return to it that often is. Paul uses two different words for anger, actually, in this little section. So he says, like, in your anger, don't sin. The word is thumos, and it means something that is quickly comes up and quickly is dealt with and subsides. And he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And he changes the word to orge, which speaks of a settled, embittered, festering condition. Uh, so I'm just suggesting, and there are righteous reasons to be angry, absolutely. When you watch somebody's marriage falling apart, you look at the cycle of addictions or homelessness or inequity or whatever it is in the world around you, I think there's, there are ways and reasons that you can be angry for good reasons. Um, but being angry for good reasons in the right time and at the right way is the art form. Be angry. The emotion is not sinful, but what you do with it can be. Not this, but this. Uh, don't steal. Is that the next one? Yeah. This feels weird. We're left to kind of fill in the blanks. I'll maybe just be brief here. I, like, you're left to wonder, like, <laughs> did a bunch of the congregation lose their jobs? Like, because of their allegiance to Jesus? Like, are they feeling forced to steal to, like, make ends meet for their family or whatever? Are they shop owners that are just charging exorbitant prices, messing with people? I don't know. Either would be wrong. Stealing at its heart is, is a selfish activity. It says, my needs, my desires, and my dignity is more important than yours. Therefore, I feel justified in taking from you to appease myself. And we could talk about shoplifting in our culture. It's ridiculous uh, and rampant, which is why every store now has to have a security guard who still can't do anything about it if people want to walk out of the store. We live in a weird place and at a weird time. Um, don't take advantage, don't, don't get well on the backs of other people is a short answer of this. What strikes me as so odd in this passage, I don't know if you caught this, we expect the answer to be, don't be selfish and, and like meet your own needs at the expense of others, but work so you don't have to. Work so you can be self-sufficient is what we expect, but it's not what he says. He says work so that you can give. And I, I want to suggest, I think it's because theft at its heart is a selfish activity. And the antidote to selfishness is not self-sufficiency, which it's a step in the right direction. But the antidote to selfishness is generosity. 
right? Not taking advantage at the expense of somebody, but choosing to be generous at the expense of my own. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Uh, <laughs> the word can speak of rotten wood, of withered flowers, of unwholesome fruit. Actually, it can speak of rancid fish. If you want something really graphic, think about the rancid fish taste in your mouth and try to avoid the gag reflex, and you have an idea of kind of the picture that Paul is painting. Unwholesome is probably too tame a word. Let's just acknowledge what comes out of our mouth has tremendous power to damage, to demean, and to diminish. As much as we parrot the playground saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but it's a thin veneer. Most of us know exactly how deeply words can wound. Some of you have carried hurtful wounds for decades. That a parent spoke, that a close friend spoke, that a teacher spoke. Words have tremendous power. Not this, but this. Use words, but use words that build up. Use words that encourage. Use words that infuse hope, that nourish and nurture the relationships and the people around you. And then lastly, Paul uses kind of this umbrella section where he talks about a variety of things. Yeah, unkindness, bitterness. I, I'm oversimplifying, and in the, in the, he uses an array. But I was going to say, after talking about all of the things that overtly tend to come out of our lives, and he says, not this, but this, I feel like this last one, he picks and chooses a bunch of things that, that sit inside. It's as if he says, like, do a little ultrasound on your heart and ask yourself, where are those places where you're harboring bitterness or resentment? Malice is another one of those things. We often feel justified in these. I actually think, as, even as followers of Jesus, churches often have many people that have these deep-seated resentments and unforgiveness and these components where we just, we wish ill towards others. I'll be happy when this person falls on their face, when this aspect of their life boomerangs, when they finally get caught. And I, I think it's Boyd Hopkins, one of the pastors in the city here, that he has an expression I'm just fond of. He says, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person will die from it. And it's so graphic, and it's so true. What you harbor inside, we do it because we think in a way it's getting back at somebody, but we discover that we're the ones that actually pay the greatest price for this. Don't be unkind. Don't harbor bitterness. Don't harbor malice. Let it go. In fact, uh, the word he uses for compassionate, here's James loves this word. I won't even try to pronounce it. You want to give it a go? There you go. You can all chat with him later about that. It's a good word for him because when he talks about membership class, he feels it in his guts. You were doing an announcement. I'm like, why am I teaching this class later? Seriously. It's a word that means to feel something in your guts. Uh, even in your bowels, that's uncomfortable. But like it's that deep-seated, it's used to describe Jesus' feeling uh, when he sees people who are hurting, who are broken, who are without those to walk and care for them. It's this deep-seated feeling that dares to feel the pain of those around you that moves you to act with kindness and with gentleness. Don't even harbor that which festers negativity in your heart. Be moved with compassion towards the needs that you see in the lives and situations around you. Not this, but this. Uh, and we should finish. Let's look at the last two verses here. Uh, in a lot of places, chapter 5 feels like we should be starting a new section, but uh, it feels like these two verses are intended as a summary statement. So follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice for God. Uh, the NIV I grew up with says, be imitators of God. The Greek word is where we get our English word mimic from. Mimic God. To which we go, that's a high bar. You'll find this actually like all the way back in Leviticus 19. You will find this in your Old Testament. God says to the nation of Israel, be holy because I am holy. Jesus picks this up in the Sermon on the Mount, uses different language. I want to say it's chapter 5. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so you find this. Because of who I am, says God, you be. Out of what I have done for you, you do. 
and, and as you kind of read the arc of Scripture, following God becomes following Jesus. In other words, how are you and I going to know how to mimic the God we can't see? And the answer is we're going to mimic the God we can. Follow and learn from the life and the story of Jesus. And it's in particular, it's in his love expressed towards us that becomes the primary motivator of how we are to turn around and then offer this to others. I found myself thinking, you and I, as kids, we just, we tend to pick up the mannerisms and parts of the personality and the skills and the behaviors and even the passions of our family, of your parents. We have expressions in our culture like father, like son, like daughter, like mother. You can mix the genders. It doesn't change the expression. We grow up often picking up what we spend, where we spend our time. And I think there's part of that aspect uh, behind this passage. Friends, when you and I spend time learning Christ, we will start to develop some of those passions and characteristics, attitudes, and otherwise that describe Jesus. What do we do with this? Uh, application is not, it's so, it's, I'm going to give this pretty open-ended this morning, but I'll just say, different situations in life call for different sets of clothing. And we just kind of understand this uh, in, intuitively. You don't generally see people wearing their dirty work boots to a wedding. You don't generally see people wearing Hawaiian shirts to a funeral. Right? Uh, you don't, we, we understand that you, you can dress different for a Garth Brooks concert than you do for the opera. And you dress a little differently if you're going to the X than if you're going to a job interview, right? Like di di different situations call for different clothes. Uh, it's just another way of kind of giving you an analogy for this passage. It says, because of Jesus and because of this new humanity, the possibility to live and grow into this new humanity that, that we've been called into, that we've been taken into, that we're invited to grow into and become, he says, you and I need new clothes. And, and there's a taking off that needs to happen in order for one to get put on. We don't generally put a tuxedo on over top of dirty work clothes. You can do it, but it, it, it's defeatist. It's uncomfortable, and, and it, it's not a healthy way to go. One needs to come off for the other to come on. And so I, was just, I would just leave you with some of these questions. What do you need to take off? What do you need to put on? And maybe I'll talk a little bit about being renewed. Yeah, it, it, wearing... Where in your life um, are, are you prone to posturing and posing? Where you're having to manipulate your image consistently for how others will perceive and respond to you? Where, where do you find yourself living into that lie, into that story of hypocrisy? Are you easily angered? Do you lash out at those around you? Do you find ways to take or keep that which is not yours? Do you get well at the expense of those around you? What kind of words come out of your mouth during the week? Do they tear down? One of the tendencies we have is that we actually feel better by, by tearing other people down. It, it's a strange way that we bolster our own kind of sense of self, right? But it comes at the expense of others. Are you naturally bitingly sarcastic? Do you find it easy to point the finger and always find the faults in others? Yeah, and what's sitting and festering? <laughs> I, I, I can't answer that question for you. Where are you harboring bitterness, unforgiveness? By the way, the word for forgiveness Paul uses in this section is actually unusual. It means to give grace. So like we would say, like, justice is giving people what they deserve. Mercy is giving, sorry, is not giving people what they deserve. And there's a time and a place for both of these. But grace is really hard because it feels so unfair. Grace is giving people what they don't deserve. Paul says, walk around gracing people. Why? Because he says this is precisely how God treats us. Yeah, what do you need to put off? What do you need to put on? What new Jesus clothes do you need to start wearing? What does it look like to speak the truth to yourself? How could you use words to build other people up this week? What would it look like to cultivate a spirit of thankfulness? What does it look like to grace people? 
or to see needs that move you with compassion. Uh, And maybe just close with this. In between the laying aside and and the putting on, Paul uses this expression about being renewed in the attitude or in the spirit of your mind. It's a present tense word, which implies that it's an ongoing process. You and I need constant renewal in how we see and process life in order to continue to learn to live into this new humanity. I'll also suggest to you, I don't think this is something you and I can do for ourselves. I don't think... Our sinful mind is capable of renewing itself. It needs Jesus to do that. What I will say is this. I do think how we posture ourselves can make a difference in the kind of access we give Jesus to our lives. And there's a reason why we often, like, are you spending time in in the word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you spending time in community with other people? I think being in these places often is a way of helping open up different aspects of our heart and our life to Jesus' work and to his presence. I'll, I'll close with what I started with, and that's just this reminder. It feels like a list of rules. Do this, do this, do this, or else. Not the heartbeat. Paul is saying, because of Jesus, we find ourselves in a new culture, and it needs a new way of seeing and responding and learning to interact and it's, it's, it's going to take work because we're not used to it. It's not our default setting. But friends, this is what we have been saved for. This is what we have been created for. And it's what we are invited to learn to practice together. Let's pray. Jesus, we give you thanks for your life and for your love poured out for us. We can try to psych ourselves up to live differently. You're the one that can actually transform and change us from the inside out. And so I ask that what you have done for us, the sacrifice that you have made for us, the love that you have showed us, the forgiveness that we did not earn and don't deserve, the grace that you continue to pour into our lives, much like just the opening three chapters of this letter, without any commands, just this reminder of what Christ has done, would continue to grip our minds and our hearts so that we would be renewed in that ongoing way. And as we capture that, that, that glimpse and that picture of, that ama- of, of the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the gift of God, that it would then begin to motivate us. When there's passion in the heart, you don't need to motivate people to do something. So may, that, may you continue to build and, and grow that passion for us of what we've received in Christ so that we could begin to live that out. And to that end, I do ask that your Holy Spirit would have that ability to prompt, to nudge, to correct, uh, and to encourage us. What do we need to be taking off and laying aside? And what new Jesus clothes do we need to be wearing in our, in our families and in our neighborhoods and in our schools as well as in our places of work? The world... Our Canadian culture should be able to look at us and go, oh, that's what your God is like. Help us live into that story a little bit more faithfully and a little bit more fully in the week ahead. This we say with thanksgiving. Amen.